Today on Between the Lines, a rags to riches tale and the story of creating one of the largest influential media companies in the world with my guest and friend, Phil Buth. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Phil started life off with cerebral palsy, but it couldn't stop him from becoming one of the most significant players of Cap City's ABC television. From his humble beginnings at a small station in Albany to becoming the president of Good Morning America, Phil learned lessons that will benefit us all. Now with his book, Limping on Water, he shows us how a company can succeed when its main focus is integrity and doing what's right. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old, and it was- You, e do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real, and that is the first thing to do. Phil, I could honestly, this is the only time I can say this, I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for you. So I need to welcome you <laughs> to a show that wouldn't exist if it wasn't for Phil Buth. Welcome to Between the Lines, Phil. Well, how long ago was it, 15, 16 years? Don't we wish, 20, you worked with 20, 20, 20, 20 that years. I worked with you was 23 years 23 ago. Years. And you were one of the great producers that I ever met but most importantly, you were one of the smartest. And that's why I always had faith in you, and I'm so proud to be able to say I knew him before he was really red hot. Oh, well, <laughs> you know, and, and I have to let the viewers know, you saved us. You, well, you literally did when, when we started our show, because I guess of that lovely belief you had in me, and you know what? It mirrors this book, and we'll get to that, well, that in, in a second. It does mirror what happens in this book, and, uh, but enough of us, right? <laughs> no, let's well, talk. I, I, but the truth is, you really did. You you bailed us out, and you well, you made, made a the show happen. You, you. you did, and, and it was uh, great. I, I am forever grateful. And it was sir. a gift that I, came right from my heart. Well, it had so, to be because I'm not paying it back. So I, no. <laughs> I, never, I never asked you to. You never great. have. You it's never great. have. And I appreciate it every once in a while. You put a little credit on the end of the show for me. I will, and Thank always you. will. Well, but I'm this just is, delighted to be here. Well, it's my pleasure. And as people see, this really is called limping on water, and yep. they'll they'll see you in in your chair now. But it's what what makes this interesting is it's part memoir. But it's also a business book. No I know question. that sounds. Fu oh, there is no question. No it, question. It really is about the adventure you had working for Capital Cities, which then later bought ABC TV yep. and became one of the largest media conglomerates, yes, and sir. the way they did it and shaped you, and the way you then shaped others, including myself, <laughs> is reflected just as it is on water in the book. Well, the, the 40 years is, is a long time. And the business has changed so much in 40 years when, from the time when you had a single one shot, uh, it was seen on a screen that was this size in 1947, 48, 50, to now a synchronous satellite can bring you a picture from any place in the world instantaneously. A lot has changed in those 40 years, but some things that were indelibly inscribed in our company never changed. And they were our philosophy. Our philosophy of doing things right, doing them things well, and when you do well, you do good. It was a philosophy that we started in 1955, and it remains, remained until the company went out of business when Disney bought us in the, in the mid-90s. And, and that meant that the, the, the fact that we, we believed in hiring the fewest people possible, the best people possible, pay them better than anybody else, give them a piece of the action, and, and leave them alone. And that's what they did to me. I was the first employee. I was thrown into jobs I didn't, I didn't really qualify for, but the pr promise was there because I was pretty well educated, and my boss, Tom Murphy, who was a remarkable man, an absolute gem of a businessman and had a heart as, as big as all. 
He was, the, he was the man who gave us all this kind of chance. And he would say to us, you can do anything you want with your job. You are an entrepreneur. You have to be ethical. You have to be frugal. You have to respect the shareholders, the audience, and, and, and our advertisers. And remember that you're no one in the community unless you put that stick that tower to work for the better of the community. And it sounded very corny, but I learned it. I learned it from day one. And for, for 40 years, I never went to work. I went to go practice what our company stood for, and that is to do good and try to, to serve the audience convenience and necessity that the FCC said we should do. And as you said, to do good is to do well, but it became so successful, this company, by doing it. This is what makes it so wonderful, is that sometimes you can be a small company and have that same motto. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's not a problem. But when you're this large, sometimes you can go astray, and you never did. This company held its guns That's to right. the point where it's used as an example to this day at the Harvard Business School of Management. Absolutely. This company is the example cited as what, and by the way, if you look at the largest companies now, it's as if they must have read this book and decided <laughs> to do the opposite, I know. unfortunately. I know. Am I right? Because well, I, this company believed in that integrity, giving back to the community, not just by making donations, oh, but no. physically. You, they stuck you in places that you had to <laughs> really, you had to re reinvent yourself almost just to be, well, when they moved you down south, I'll never forget that. You were a New York City boy <laughs> down south, with, and, and that was a culture shock. It sure was for my family especially. But you see, I turned everything into something solid because I've always been a positive person. Warren Buffett now is quoted often, and I spoke with him just a day or two ago. He wants to talk about this book with his, his friends. I got an email two days ago from the former president of Gray Television, and Prather is his name, Bob Prather. He said, our mutual friend Warren says, I should buy one of your books for each of my department heads. Now, I, and of course, it's in the mail right now to them. But, but it was, it, it was harder, as you say. In the beginning, we had to be cost conscious. We had to be cheap, cheap, cheap. It was a small station, bought a bankrupt station. We were losing money. It was Lowell Thomas's money. Many people don't remember Lowell Thomas, the genius, the great uh, humanitarian and broadcaster. Hello, everybody. So long till tomorrow. It was Lowell Thomas. And I had the privilege of working with him. But his, his, it was his investment in a UHF station in Albany that started all this. And we watched every single penny. Now, as we grew, that philosophy, as we bought other companies, that philosophy was new to many of them. And uh, we have a history of buying properties. We had a history of buying properties, which after a couple of years were being run at such massively better inv uh, efficiency than anyone could ever imagine. It became our trademark. We bought the Kansas City Star, and overnight, almost overnight, if they, when they adapted our feelings and our philosophies, profits went crazy. And, and that happened in dozens of our properties. Well, when you bought ABC, I, oh. I, there's a, now, now here's the thing, as you, as you called it, it was the minnow swallowing the whale. Yes, that now, was everyone it. heard of ABC TV. They then said, that the, the thought was, well, they must be merging with this thing called Cap Cities. That's the way it first came out. There was no way. And then they find out later, Cap Cities is buying this network. And there are stories in here about that. Well, first of all, I want to... Cut Tons up. of stories. Well, let me tell you, let me tell you I, I, I'm not going to give away too much of it because I want people to discover it themselves, but I want to tell two of them at least right away. First of all, you single-handedly, you are not single-handedly, you would never allow yourself to say that. I know that. You and all the great people that were under you and worked with you and worked for you, you made gen, uh, GMA, Good Morning America, which never, ever was number one you turned that show into the number one morning show beating the Today Show for 
gosh long knows time, how many years time, that you were there, time. and it was the first time ever. Uh, uh, Barry, I have to correct you. They did have a period where they were number one for a short period of time over the Today Show. Then they fell, and then I, I came in. Okay, then you know what? You should have put it in the book. What? But, no. <laughs> but, hey, but okay, so I'll, I'll give you that it was, much. Uh, David but, Hartman but, was number one for a while. But here's the part that I loved the most was Brandon Stoddard. And what he said to you was, man. though, because here are all these guys. Now, here's the Cap Cities. They just bought ABC. And all of you are walking. Cap Cities, all of you are walking to your next meeting. And he turns to you and he says, Phil... The difference between our organization and yours is you guys work poor but live rich. That was a little later. It wasn't the same day as we took over, but that's, oh, that's exactly well, what you, he now, said. Now, you know, just because you got me out of hot water, now you're going to correct I me want all the to, time? I want right, to be tell precisely the truth. Go, go accurate. Ahead. I visited uh, Brandon <laughs> after I got the job because he was supposed to be my boss, but he didn't want anything to do with Good Morning America. He wanted to worry about winds of war, which we had just bought and inherited a huge headache from ABC. And I met him in his, in his office. We looked at the script, and I turned the pages, and I saw $7 million for horsemen going through some kind of, of, of mountain pass. I said, Brandon, we could, you don't have to do this in Yugoslavia. You can do it in, in Montana. $7 million for 45 seconds on the, on the screen. And I said, you could do that. He says, yeah, you're probably right, but we'd lose our director. That's his Hollywood. <laughs> but again, that was the day he said that you you guys live uh, uh, work poor and live rich, and he was he was right. He was a wonderful man, and I was just so sorry that he passed last year. Ah, uh, well, you know that you're filled with stories of wonderful men. But the reason is, I'm positive of this. Well, you even say it here. You say in the book even that happenstance, luck, and coincidence. Without them, I would never have ended up at Cap Cities. Now, there's quite a lot of coincidences here yeah. that really you wouldn't even be here if some of them didn't occur and we'll maybe we'll get time into it but the point is is that even with happenstance luck and coincidence playing a major role in all of our lives it was your own work ethic that Murphy saw right away and I experienced it when I met you you experienced it you uh -huh. saw in me that same work ethic. You knew, and just like Murphy knew, that there was a guy that was never going to give up, was going to be willing to do anything. And it was your own, what you exuded, that brought that confidence that ended up allowing you, as has been quoted many times, luck is the residue of design. And you really designed your own life to and, be and that kind of worker. Dan Burke and Tom Murphy were the best combination in business, according to Warren Buffett, that, that ever, whoever existed. And, and they set examples for us. And because the ex I happened to be the first person it worked on, it, it was beginning to work. And then it worked with, 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 the, with the Potashes and the, the Daniels and the, and the Shruts and the other people who came along. It, it, was, a, it was a brotherhood that we had. It wasn't necessarily a company. There were no politics. Larry Pollack used to say, the politics of our company is there are none. And because if you wanted to pick up the phone and talk to Tom Murphy, you picked up the phone and talked to Tom Murphy, even though he was three levels above you. Because there hardly ever were three levels, because we had very few vice presidents. We operate lean and mean. We operated lean and mean, and, and we're our own bosses. We had such independence and autonomy in our company that it made a difference. People would say to me, you know, you guys don't ever write resumes because nobody ever wanted to leave the company. And, and that's, that's, that's part of the quote from the Harvard Business School uh, uh, review of our company. And the facts are that the stock went crazy. The stock, you saw it in the book. Oh, five? Can I, let me tell oh. them. It went you bought the first share That's right. at $5. By the way, I remember this phone call. And 75 cents. $5.75. And then I believe it was when Disney bought the company. Before the buy. Before the buy. It went up that one share. 
6,890. 280. So, boy, you remember it to the penny, don't you? Look at that. I wish I'd saved all the shares, but, you know, you have to live. (laughs) Oh, 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 and you don't do too bad of a job, sir. You don't do too bad of a job. (laughs) uh, But that was was good and bad. It, it, It sometimes gave my children, I gave them shares early, and uh, they were all beautiful children. And, and then I realized that it grew too fast. And so I had to cut, stop, stop giving them money. They, they had more money to go to college than it cost. Oh. But, but we, we managed to handle that. But I'm gonna take, I gotta knock some of this humbleness out of you. I know it's very hard to do because you're such a humble man, but let me ask I'm you this. I'm not a humble man, my it. ego is terrific. I All mean, right, good. How can you and I survive without an ego? I agree right? with that, but then I need to at least get you back to one point. Murphy and Burke were not there when you were a short order cook. And you had that same work philosophy when you were a short order cook. So I'm glad that Tom Murphy and Dan Burke really brought it out but it was there, young man. And you know, so many people helped me. The, be- the father of my best friend who lived on the right side of the tracks where we lived in a little three-room apartment with my widowed mother. And he said to me, Mr. Emerson, his name was Harold Olson Sr., Happy Olson. He said, where are you going to college? Well, I'm going to community college. I have no money. He said, well, we'll see about that. And that story is remarkable. Oh. How I got into Union College, which <laughs> is so important to me. What happened at Union College was fantastic. It, it, it brought me out of an unsophisticated environment where I didn't know what a scotch and soda was because our family never drank. My boss, Tom Murphy, we were, we were out of Veterans of Foreign Hall, Foreign, Foreign Hall and, and we were showing the building of a new tower in Albany, 1940, 1959 or so, and Tom goes up to the counter and to the bar before the meeting and he says would you like to have a drink Phil and he was a teetotaler well, I said well I, I'll have a I'll have a Ryan ginger and he said a what I said Tom we don't drink you know, my uncle's a plumber and he drinks Ryan ginger <laughs> and he said to the bartender give him a cutty sock and soda all right <laughs> and that's what I occasionally drank for the next 15 years <laughs> socially <laughs> fortunately oh. so I it was I was unsophisticated. I had no money, and so many people held me, helped me along the way. That's why I feel so good about all the wonderful things we're able to do now for charities and, and, and organizations. And that's why I'm selling this book and giving the, all the profits, if there are any, to, to charities. Well, Phil, and you've been doing that all your life. And, and, and even the people you met, the advice you give. I, I have, there's one story in here I, I must talk about. Mr. Taddeus Kanopka. Oh, come on. Taddeus Kanopka. Taddeus Kanopka. Yes. Tell us. Wonderful man. We hired out of Providence when we were doing a show in the old nunnery in Albany, and none of us had any money. And then we met this guy named Taddeus Kanopka. His real name was Ted Knight. And And we hired him, and he did everything on the show, everything. And one day he came to me. I can't live on $100 a week, or 125 or whatever it was. He said, I need a raise. And I said, we all need raises, Ted, but go up and talk to Tom Murphy. He's a wonderful man. So it took him weeks to get up enough courage to go up the green stairway to Tom's office in an old nunnery. And he came back an hour later. I was sitting on the pedestal of a camera. And he comes in, and he got a big smile. He said, oh, Phil, what a great idea that was. I just talked to Tom Murphy. What a man he is. What, how great. You know what he told me? He told me that if he gave me a $50 raise, it would be the worst thing that ever happened to me because I should go to Hollywood. That's what I mean. And there and he, he becomes, did. He becomes Ted Knight and, and he became he becomes like Ted Baxter on Ted the Mary Baxter. Tyler Moore show. And he, and he became my lifelong friend until his premature death in 86. And he was a lovely man. My family considered him their favorite uncle. Well, another advice from Tom about business, Tom Murphy. Philly always talking to you Philly always try to make others look good because when they profit so do you and always leave something Uh, on the table no question about it all my life I've tried to do that I did that this morning this morning with the with the man about to sell the books one of the sellers of the books it's 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 just good business and this time I was desperate trying to find some work 
because I had a couple of children early and I was making $125 a week in 1958 or 9. And I met a man from GE and he wanted me to help him sell a big machine, the, the base plate drilling machine. It was a big green monster in his plant in Schenectady. And I suggested we make a film. He says, what do you mean? I said, well, we can make a color film and show the, the drills coming down and the swirls on the drill, all in different colors. And he said, that's great. How much would that cost? And off the top of my head, I said $30,000. Now, I had made one film in graduate school, all right? And I went home that night and figured out how to do it. And I wrote a script. I got through it. And I told Murph, I said, Murph, I got to do this on my off time. I was a director from 6 in the morning till 2. And in the afternoons, I did that film. And, and we made thirty plus $10,000 on, on, on more prints. And I said, Murph, I'm making so much money. But I could have, they told me they could have paid 60000 And that's when he said to me, Philly, just, were you pleased with the thirty? I said, yes. He said, then be satisfied. Leave something on the table. That was my first of many occasions to do exactly that. Again, we, we talk about this company and the advice uh, and the business model, but I think if anything is important, this is something that I really want every executive out there, every manager out there, anyone that leads a team to really realize these are the words you write. And I, again, I can't remember who said them. Maybe they're yours. Maybe they're Tom Murphy or quoting or, or Dan Burke, but these are them. Be careful what you say to <laughs> subordinates. You will forget in 24 hours, but they will remember it word for word forever. And that was from Dan Burke, one of the greatest men I've ever known in my life. His son runs NBC now. And uh, Dan Burke was so important to me. He died too soon, a few years ago. But he, he had a number of those um, those expressions. Uh, never tweak an angry bear <laughs> was one of them. And I list them all in the, in the book, or not many of them in the book, but it's true. Remember what you say to subordinates. They'll never forget. You will, but they'll never forget. <laughs> and, and again, I think we go back to the fact that you, as you said, they made you feel like you were your own entrepreneur. Once you had that position, if I could, again, leave, if that, if that could be impressed on, on business today to allow people to feel that they are more than an employee, that, and, and not just feel it, your company made it so. They got you the stocks, they did Absolutely. all those things. Absolutely. And then they let you make those decisions. And you even, if you made a wrong decision, I remember that advice, I think it was, uh, I'll paraphrase it so I don't have to look it up, but it was something about them talking about Ty Cobb. And they said that, you know, here's the man that was the greatest baseball average, 420, which means he still failed 50% yeah. of the up. time. Don't give that up. Don't give up. And that Burke was it. That's again. Dan Burke again. Yeah. yeah. We had such a leadership that, that it was so rare. People used to envy me because I worked for this great company. And, uh, and it was. It was a, an absolute privilege every single day to work for this company. I never felt like I was going to work. I felt like I was using that tower for the best, the best device, the best thing we could do for the communities. And we were active in so many ways, more than most television stations were in community affairs. And, and it's, it was true in every market I was ever in. And I try to express that in the book. But throughout the book, I, I realize I'm a lucky guy. I was a very lucky guy who happened to be able to use his talent, whatever it was, as an entrepreneur with great autonomy. Our company was not run from New York. It was run from your office as general manager, wherever you are, newspaper, cable, radio. And we had a great radio group, too, absolutely wonderful, sometimes never given the credit that they, they actually deserved. But we had a great brotherhood. Well, I'm going to actually end on those words. You talked about being lucky, and these are your words. I was always blessed and lucky to work with good people about whom I cared deeply. And Phil, 
I was so blessed <laughs> to work with you, who Thank I you. care Thank so you. deeply. It was wonderful. Uh, Absolutely Phil. wonderful. And you didn't do badly, you know. Ah, uh, thank you, Phil. I don't want my head to get too swollen, okay? Thank you, Phil. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. Attaboy. You got it. And thank you guys for joining us. Now, before Phil leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Limping on Water. Generations of youths are grateful that Tom Murphy and Dan Burke put together such a success story executed by loyal, responsible people who dedicated themselves not only to winning, but also to the high standards of capital cities, proving that doing it right can pay off. I'm Barry Kibrick. Too often there is a large gap between success and doing what's right. Close that gap and it will pay off in more ways than ever imagined. Thank you, Philly. That's beautiful. Oh, Thank I you. love you, brother. Thank, Thank you. you so much. So true. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the best, such, Phil. Such a great privilege to be here. Closed captioning for Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible by your generous contributions to KLCS Education Foundation. Thank you for your support. To connect with Barry, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, watch past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com.